Hi, everybody. I'm Robert Trinevich. I'm the data science evangelist at Hornworks. You might have caught me yesterday shooting the uh, gun at the Demo Palooza, or perhaps you're at the Spark crash course, or we'll join the data science crash course, or deep learning crash course tomorrow. So today I wanted to talk about you know, overcoming the AI hype um, and what really the enterprises should focus on. And the idea for this talk really comes from you know, seeing uh, a lot of the news about AI hype um, and AI being overly hyped um, by the media through a point where you know, we're going to discuss different points throughout, the, throughout this presentation of what I mean exactly. Um, and uh, I wanted to make sure that we tone it down and really focus on specifics that are important to you, to the enterprises, and what you're doing in the AI space. Although it is a business talk, uh, towards the end I'm going to dive with a few more details. Um, really, uh, what I wanted to do, rather than you know, focus on the rules of threes, where you get you know, three recommendations, give you just a little bit more, so perhaps you can you know, take a picture uh, and have you know, a few more things that then you can take back and what specific questions you want to ask yourself or your team or you want to focus and then start with specific recommendations, this is what I really want to bring out throughout. So one thing that I want to start with, uh, you know, my background in the data science and you know, a bit of deep learning starts with uh, our car uh, with Team Case from Case Western Reserve University. That's 2007 when we launch, you know, it's a slightly bigger version of what you've seen on stage today. Um, it's a you know, real size car that we drove in Victorville, California and we've competed with uh, 80 other teams. So that's back in 2007. We already had autonomous cars. Uh, two years before, there was a desert challenge. Uh, so you know, we've been on that journey. From that point on, um, I've done quite a few other things. Uh, and you know, I'm now back into focusing solely on data science and deep learning and things like that. So with that, I wanted to discuss and maybe distinguish two types of AI, and that is important because I think there's a lot of confusion of what AI is. So the AI, the, the AI that began in, you know, in, the, in the 50s when they started to talk about, what they've meant is the general AI, um, or AGI, um, and that AI by other names is also called the anthropomorphic AI, by some analysts, pure AI, and that is the AI that's got the human-like capabilities of the reasoning, the understanding, uh, knowledge transfer, things like that. Versus what we have and what enterprises should focus on is the narrow pragmatic AI. This is the AI that's got specific use cases, specific examples, um, and a way to go about and make sure that you have meaningful results um, and you have specific return on whatever the investment that you had. So the talk over here will touch about a little bit of, you know, of, of the hype on, the, on this general AI, anthropomorphic AI, um, and then we're going to move towards the narrow AI and specific things that will help you move things forward. One, uh, one common thing, um, you know, there's also a lot of confusion, and uh, it seems that today AI and machine learning essentially became indistinguishable. I found this image the other day. I really loved it. Um, a lot of statisticians have found themselves in a place where now they've been rebranded as machine learning um, engineers or, or developers or scientists, and now machine learning is coming back to being called um, artificial intelligence. Again, this is artificial intelligence as bag of technologies, not this AI, this general AI, as everybody likes to talk about. Uh, so, uh, and, and the reason why it's becoming, you know, called artificial intelligence yet again is because AI during one of those cycles of, of um, you know, the, the winter times where AI becomes less popular, they wanted to rebrand to machine learning, but now AI is hot again, so we call it, um, you know, AI and it's, it's all good. So these cycles of winters and, and, and summers, uh, right now, you know, we're uh, at, at the peak and the, of the hype cycle in AI. So calling it AI is, is perfectly fine. So just that you know that AI really is this bag of technologies, and we'll discuss some of them throughout these slides. And um, one farther, um, one last uh, comment on what is the general intelligence is probably I've searched for probably the best definition, and I really like this one. It's, it's a system that, that can behave intelligently across a wide range of goals and environments. And that is very important because 
some of the things I'll mention is, you know, the limits of today's AI as it goes into being applicable, being able to take it from one environment and put it in another and behave competently, um, being able to pursue multiple goals. So again, this, this AI that's very performing, that we see good examples that is applicable to the industry is very narrow with specific examples. That's where it works. Taking what you've trained in one set and putting it elsewhere usually doesn't work and breaks miserably. And I'll show you some of the examples. Two individuals that I really want to mention here, um, you've heard about Ray Kurzweil the other day uh, by Brian Hopkins from Forrester. Um, you know, his book uh, is, is based on that paper about the exponential technologies. Um, and I wanted to mention that one specifically because what he takes and extrapolates is, you know, that these exponential technologies, faster processors, GPUs, more data, etc. It's great, and that will bring about singularity. And the problem with that is, if you think about it, just because we can process something faster, we can grab more data, et cetera, doesn't necessarily mean that we've solved for this general AI system. What I, might, what I mean by that is that just because, for example, you know, the dog can process and think uh, 10 to, uh, or 1,000 times faster, that doesn't mean necessarily that the dog actually is becoming a human level. It's just a dog that thinks 10 times or 1,000 times faster. Um, and then, of course, we have the other individual, Mick Bostrom. He wrote this book, Super Intelligence. Um, that one talks about the goals of AI and um, where the goals are misaligned with our human goals. And that's where the dangers lie. And again, these books uh, do scare a lot of people. Um, media, the news outlets love to pick up on that and extrapolate of, you know, and, and spell out the doomsday for us uh, humans. But Really, we're still far away, and, and if you sample all the cutting um, uh, you know, professors and researchers in this domain, we're still far, far off from what these gentlemen um, you know, mentioned. And I'll touch base on some of the individuals that I look forward uh, and I look up to when, um, when uh, you know, evaluating the state of AI, uh, specifically the state of uh, general AI. Now, uh, one thing, you know, in the news, again, we had uh, a lot of this, you know, that the robots will take the jobs away, that the AI will take jobs away. Just for reference, um, this has been happening on this 20-year cycle for quite a while, really since the 20s, uh, and, you know, really up to today. We've had these news, especially when AI becomes, you know, overhyped and super hot. We have these news that are trying to scare away. So that's something to take away that, you know, this is, this is nothing new. We've been here. It's just that we're at this peak hype cycle. So take that into consideration when you talk to a lot of these developers, and always make sure you take this with a grain of salt. Um, by the way, how many of you watch or are watching Westworld? All right, that's quite a few. It's, it's one of my favorite shows. I've, I was pleasantly surprised. Again, it's a rerun. Um, there, was, um, there was an earlier version uh, of the TV's episodes in, uh, I believe, 70s. So again, we got you know, this peak hype cycle. So robots with these uh, you know, consciousness and ability to think like humans and now being at war with humans is quite interesting. So we have that again in the media. And that's part of the hype of, you know, seeing of where and what could go wrong uh, with some of these designs. Wally, of course, um, you know, we have Disney in the media itself. Uh, I like this one because, you know, you have the emotional component robot and it plays on what uh, I did during my masters of trying to emulate some of the emotions in the AI system. So um, that background with autonomous driving cars and a few other things I did in, um, in between gives me um, a unique and interesting perspective and something that I closely follow to see where we are today. Um, and one more point, you know, uh, from, from the hype cycle perspective, from where we are today and, you know, what we haven't kind of accomplished, you know, Marvin Minsky, uh, professor of uh, MIT's uh, AI lab, just like Kevin uh, that spoke before me, um, you know, he said that within a generation, uh, the problem of creating artificial intelligence, and he's talking about the artificial general in terms of that point, will substantially be solved. And, you know, 10 years have passed and nothing has happened. We're still not here today. So, again, take that into consideration where you're reading all the different news, overhyping things of, you know, what we have today and I'll tone it down for uh, what's, you know, evaluate what's useful for you. 
We've had though some specific examples of you know that we've heard at the keynotes. You know Gary Kasparov in top left uh, with the uh, IBM Deep Blue in the late 90s. You know he was defeated by back then algorithms. Have you heard that if you combine the humans and the algorithms today, they're much much better than the machines themselves. You, we had uh, Watson and Jeopardy, uh, and of course the most recent was the AlphaGo. Now there's a, um, and I introduce the gentleman in just a moment, but uh, with the AlphaGo, the DeepMind team behind AlphaGo, um, a gentleman named Rodney Brooks uh, visited the team and asked him, you know, so what would happen if we've, we've changed the size of the board itself? So, I don't know, instead of 20, 20, you went to 15 by 15 or 25 by 25. How would this amazing algorithm that defeated the world champion in Go, how would it behave? And they basically laughed at him and said, you know, if you just change this board by one, if you go one higher, one lower, this whole algorithm breaks down. So again, what I wanted to highlight is, you know, it performs very well in a specific data sets, but suddenly you perturb the system um, or, or, you, or you go outside of the data set that it hasn't seen before, the system doesn't behave as performantly uh, as it should. So again, keep this in mind. These systems look amazing. You know, there's there's a lot of great marketing and then films and everything. And again, that hype. But know that these systems behave in these specific institutions, and transferring the knowledge to other domains usually doesn't work out. There are ideas, of course, in, in this AlphaGo um, example of you know, what if we just train the system? Well, these massively trained systems, by the way, take took a lot of resources to do just that. And it's not just deep blue, there are other techniques were, that were involved, and we train it around different sizes of the board. So, I mean, that, that's fine, but as a human, if you looked at the board and you've attempted to play this game, if the board suddenly was smaller, you would still be able to, um, to play this game quite efficiently and quite well, something that the machines still can't do. Um, you know, you've seen, uh, so from the applications that actually do work right now, we have, you know, deep learning transfers, um, and that's one thing that I wanted to mention. So things that do work, um, and that will um, be concerning, uh, we'll, need to, uh, we'll need to, you know, care more about and really pay attention to is these systems of where you can generate images, where you can generate voice, um, and, the, and, and specifically as it pertains to you know, our democracies of how will this influence the news and what we perceive. And that will be important because you know, suddenly we have these AI systems that will be able to blend different faces to generate images that don't exist in the real world. And if we don't have AIs that actually help us out to pick up um, and, and identify these fakes, we're going to have a problem. Actually, a lot of researchers that work on these on generative images or voices, et cetera, are being hired by the big companies to help them identify the fakes. So identifying the fakes of, or finding out the fakes algorithmically and then highlighting that to you as an individual will be a big part because very soon the problem that we'll have is we won't be able to recognize what is real and what is not. Now, of course, Probably many of you have seen these general images. You know, you have a picture in the top left, you have your Eiffel Tower in Paris, um, and, and a painting of, of, of certain type. What we can do is, you know, have a transfer of, uh, of that type of imaging. So there's cool things that do work. Cool things that allow you to switch, um, you know, in, in, in the middle top, you have, you know, switch between horses and zebras and, you know, horses uh, and, and winters and summers to the left and from photos to a painting, paint to the photos and then transfer different styles. So we can do that. Those are the kind of things that we are capable of doing. Um, this one is actually quite interesting. How many of you have seen this one before? All right, none of you. So let's let's do a quick show of hands. Um, uh, how many of you uh, think that all of these been generated by a human? All of these been painted by an artist? What about a quarter of them? One, half. You got some hands. Three fourths. What about all of these? All right, so no hands for all of these. What is surprising is that all of these were generated by the machine. And, you know, if you have an artist, I've spoken to a few artists, they say, like, yeah, it doesn't seem like these would be fully generated by artists, but the idea is, and sort of like Kevin mentioned, you know, 
you, we have these AI systems that now can generate images or generate music or samples of music or pre-generate um, uh, samples of, of playlists. And similarly in this domain, when, when, when it comes to artists, we can pre-generate a lot of different images and move from that point on as an inspiration point for you as an artist. So we have these tools where the humans come in the loop and now we, you know, an artist can take a look, okay, if I modify one of these images, and actually really, really interesting painting can come, up, um, can come out of it, right? So we have these uh, really neat designs that we can take it forward and have an influence of how we do our work. So that AI plus human will be uh, a, a very powerful and give um, those who do use these technologies um, maybe a really good advantage. Of course, we have the Alexas, um, or if you use Alexas, or you've heard, um, uh, you know, uh, if, if, if you watch the Google I.O. Of, of introducing the new, uh, the new um, uh, Google Assistant, um, what was really neat was we're getting to the point where uh, you can tell an assistant, you know, schedule me an appointment between this and that time, and it's become so good, the actual voice generation, that you know, it will call and talk to an actual human being on the other line, and um, during the demo, you know, at least the two examples that they've showed, maybe those are the ideal scenarios, um, because they were not native speakers and so forth, they could not tell that this is actually AI talking on the other end. So we're coming to a point where you, know, you can have AI fakes, um, whether it's images, whether it's sound, and things like that, that will be playing in, and we'll need to create policies or other assistance that will help us determine that whether we are actually talking to the human on the other line. So we are here today. And of course, you know, technologies that allow you to um, quickly, um, you know, basic system, basic machine learning for recommender systems, whether it's Netflix, whether it's Amazon, Nextbox product, sentiment detection. So those are the kind of things, for example, that I'll be talking about today and my crash courses of, you know, these are the things that are easy, right? These are the things that are easy solvable. The human genome, uh, genome, that's, you know, it's solvable in the sense that, you know, now we have all the data and now we can uh, sequence the entire genome, but it's still, it's still a problem of identifying of what's what. Um, by the way, how many of you have seen Baby X? All right, nobody. I highly recommend to check out BabyX. If you just go to YouTube and type BabyX, uh, again, they, uh, they're working with, with uh, a lot of the artists, um, and they're uh, trying to simulate how the brain works. And it's fascinating because this baby has these emotional expressions um, uh, that, that very closely resemble uh, how an actual baby would behave. Again, this technology is still what you've seen today. It's just a combination of these different techniques makes it seem like the baby is alive, like the baby uh, is emotionally responding to you, recognizing images on the camera on the other side. It's, it's a little bit eerie when you watch it, but I highly recommend you check it out because it's an amalgamation of these technologies that we have today with the limits that we have today. But when you combine interesting ways, it's a way to fool you to say like, oh, wow, this baby does have emotions when it really does not, right? And of course, we are sending uh, robots into space that are working on the space station with astronauts. We have technology, we have these control mechanisms. So combining you know, vision detection with deep learning and, and, and really good control systems, we have these very um, neat systems that do work. Well, if you're in Mountain View, if you're in this area, you've seen these vehicles around um, and, and, and they're driving around and this, this autonomous push is, is great. Now, of course, it's great when you have these ideal conditions. But what happens, you know, like, like the Uber uh, accident recently, um, you know, occurred. I've actually pulled this from the National Transportation uh, Safety Board and this one is interesting because this is what actually happened with the recent Uber accident. So, you know, the report says that the uh, obtained data from the self-driving system, uh, it, the, the LiDAR itself, the LiDAR that you've seen on that little robot car today at the keynote, it detected that pedestrian six seconds before the impact uh, when the vehicle was driving, uh, you know, only 43 miles an hour. Now, what's interesting, it classify the pedestrian as an unknown object, uh, than as a bicycle with varying expectations of the future path, right? If you're a human and you see, well, this, this looks like a, like a human, you would just continue to have it in your mind that this is a human, not a bicycle, not some other random objects that's going on. 
And what's interesting as a system, so here's, here's the things that, you know, it's AI, things can be recognized, obstacle Americas, but it's the problem with the systems that where at 1.3 seconds before the impact, the self-driving system determined that the emergency braking was needed to mitigate a collision. So it knew it should engage the, um, uh, the emergency braking, but the braking maneuvers were not enabled while the vehicle is under computer control to reduce the erratic behavior. Uh, so, uh, so, it's, so it's interesting that the last sentence go, the vehicle operator is relied on to intervene the and take action, unless, of course, what seemed to happen, the operator is on the phone fully trusting the vehicle, um, and the system was not designed to alert the operator. So in this case, we have, we have a great example of the human in the loop failed, that the system design to alert and engage the human in a meaningful way uh, failed, and there was a bit too much trust into what the machines can do. So it's going to take a while to, um, uh, to get these systems of where you know, we find the right balance of, you know, here's the AI system that's perfect in this very specific, still narrow domain, and how we put the humans in the loop, and how we create that interface between the humans and AI, so there's optimal, so don't we repeat those kind of accidents. Now, one thing I want to mention, and you see this is, there's a banana, but there's a toaster. There's this thing called AI hacking, specifically it relates to deep learning hacking. And what happens is, you know, on top, you would have your classifiers. You might have seen a lot of these live examples before. And, you know, there's a banana, and, you know, with 100% uh, in green says, okay, I've classified this as, as a banana, right? I'm really sure it's a banana. But what you see there are those stickers that have these in between neural nets pre-generated. And if you put that sticker next to the banana, suddenly it will think it's a toaster. You can sort of kind of see that it, it is a toaster, but to a human being, to us, if we looked at the image, like it's, it's a banana. There should be nothing about that image that says it's a toaster, but these systems can easily be fooled. And I could go through more examples where this gets more dangerous. If we talk about the vehicles themselves, you could put these kind of stickers on stop signs and suddenly thing it's a yield sign or a speed limit sign. So things happen very rapidly in an unexpected way. So although we have these technologies, there's a lot that has to be built of how we test these technologies, how we evaluate them, and how we make sure that they're safe. And this is the gentleman that I mentioned before, Rodney Brooks. Highly recommend his blog, by the way, because he's actually work with robots. You know, he's a co-founder of the Rethink Robotics uh, on the top right, and this is one of those robots that actually works with humans um, in, in all kinds of different spaces. It's also at MIT. And he's got, at least from my perspective, a more pragmatic view um, of what's what uh, and what is, what is possible. In 2016, you know, Andrew Ng, uh, he declared, you know, this is really when we're coming up to the hype curve, you know, AI is the new electricity, um, and, you know, AI needs to be this company-wide strategic decision. Uh, so, indeed, it has to be. I think that, you know, we're just pushing AI as a solution to everything a little bit too far, and we've got to take it back and see, like, what are the specific things that really are applicable here. By the way, um, uh, let me see if I can go back. Okay. Um, if you or your team want to learn about machine learning or deep learning, I, f I really highly recommend um, uh, his, his courses on Coursera. He's also got a lot of videos on, um, on, on YouTube when he was teaching at Stanford. A phenomenal individual explains these topics, topics um, very, very well. Uh, so the one question, what is driving all this AI explosion? There are really three things that we're behind. One is, you all know, you're all here, is the exponential data growth. Two is an, an already you know, faster and open distributed system. So many of these systems that we have, for example, Spark, you know, they're really faster. They can go across the clusters of, 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 of computers, of system, and now we can process and take all this data. And of course, finally, we have these smart algorithms that, you know, one hand, we have these deep learning um, algorithms that are becoming better and better. They can focus on more specific things. Um, and they also work well with these two distributed systems. One thing I wanted to do is, if you ever wanted to visualize what is, you know, this, you, have, you have these exponential data growth, right? Uh, what is 50 zettabytes? And that's, you know, 2021. We're expecting about 20, uh, 50 zettabytes if we extrapolate the line, but the current data growth 
estimates it could be even faster. This, if you stack one terabyte drives, the one terabyte drives, just you know, one known closure that you have in your system, and if you think about you know, just stacking kind of like the Jenga, one on, one on top of the other, we would stack them from Earth to the moon. That was the over 330,000 uh, kilometers. So that's how much data we're generating with our IoT systems um, or, or internally with the social media and so forth. So it's a lot of data, and now these systems can come in and process all the data. Of course, again, and I'll uh, touch on that, not all data is great. Now, this is a quote that I found and, and is being shared quite a bit. You know, Google does not have better algorithms, but more data. Definitely, it's true. But I also agree that Google's got pretty good data scientists on their team that can continually optimize and figure out what's the best combination of different algorithms or um, you know, machine learning applications. Um, you've seen this before, you've seen this actually at the keynote, so just to give you an idea of how much data is being generated, for example at CERN, where we have the uh, particle accelerators, there's 12.3 petabytes per month, the autonomous cars, during the keynotes you've seen this, 4 terabytes per day per car, or if you're looking at the genome sequence, it's about 100 gigabytes per sequence, that's a full sequence, right, um, and that's compressed, if you're looking at uncompressed, that's over 300 gigabytes. So. This is, there are things, there are spaces which are really, really data hungry, um, and we need these systems, these very um, systems that distribute it well in order to process all of this. Um, and, the, and coming back to the data perspective, you know, there's the data that's new oil, right? So we have AI as the new electricity, data as the new oil, right? One power is the other. But really what's important and uh, important to keep in mind is the training data, which is the new, new oil by some claims. And the reason they make this claim is you could have a lot of data. You could be generating a lot of data, but the actual data that is useful to train, that's useful to make prediction, is, uh, is, is narrow, is relatively small. So there's definitely one thing to always keep in mind. It's like, you know, we've got all this data, but how much of this data is actually useful? How much of this data can we actually use to have to build a meaningful product, a product that will help us make predictions, product that will help us make better decisions, or perhaps, you know, just data that gives us insightful analytics. I like this quote, um, you know, I'm the effectiveness of AI technologies will be only as good as the data they have access to. So it comes back and reaffirms this idea of, you know, having good, high quality, clean training data. And that the most valuable data may exist beyond the borders of one's organization. So if, if you're a startup, if you're a small business, small to medium business, you might want to work on a project, but you might not have the access to data. So going to and being able to find that data, being able to actually capture data that will allow you to, um, uh, to do that training will be one of those challenges uh, in the near future. A lot of, a lot of right now, the, the moat that, th that the companies have is having this unique, uh, specific data that they can use, data that the, you know, the competitors do not have. But if you do not have data, you have to be creative of how do I either generate the data or capture the data from other source. Or perhaps my colleague Dinesh, we recently published this one, and we're thinking in, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the blockchain space, you know, um, and so, so we've spoken like, you know, how would we have these access to data in the future? So you want to have specific use cases. You want to have, you want to bring more data to your system. So in the future, data marketplaces will be, um, will be the thing of, you know, how do we bring this extra data? And of course, we'll have to be sensitive about it. You know, different spaces, different verticals. Some verticals might be applicable to bring the data in while others, uh, we might have to be more careful. Uh, for example, if you think about the medical field, you know, on one hand you have, you can bring the data um, and share the patient data, but for example, you don't want the advertisers or uh, the manufacturers of different drugs to also have that data, right? So you, we might have to have specific uh, verticals that are only accessible to specific uh, providers and we have to have a lot of policy behind that. So, as you move on this path, uh, you might have seen this pyramid of needs, and I like just to call this pyramid of AI, is what is it that you need before you can reach this pinnacle of, you know, of, of building these really cool, highly performant um, AI systems that give you, that provide a lot of value to the company. And of course, at the bottom, you either collect or you buy that data 
um, and there's a lot of the movement and storage. Um, and then, of course, as you bring the data, you have to you know, explore it. So I have some data engineers with data scientists working of you know, what is the data? What, what is the data? How useful is it? What can we do with it? And then you move through aggregating and labeling. For example, if you're using specific supervised type of training, then you need to label the data, and that's a very long and tedious process generally. And then you, as you build, you learn and optimize. And finally, you build the AI. So one thing I wanted to point out, you know, we had some people to actually uh, ask us, like, you know, so where, for example, does Horton work? So the products that we offer, you know, we are in the space of bringing the data, right, whether it's uh, data flow, uh, to data processing and storage, and then building up through the space. Of course, you've heard we have this very tight partnership with uh, IBM, IBM Data Science Experience, but we also are open to all these other open source uh, or, or closed source uh, platforms that build on top. So really, we would enable you to bring all the data, and then through all these different systems, you can build up on top for these data science platforms. So to wrap these things up, I want to make sure to give you specific uh, insights that I found over time of you know, what is useful. So if you look at Harvard Business Review and you know, the rules of threes, they'll give you the top three and you know, find and own the valuable data. Thank you. Take the systematic view and find data agents, agencies, adjacencies, and then, of course, very importantly, once you're done, how do you actually deploy, how do you package this AI for the customer experience, for the end user? And of course, if you go, um, again, Andrew Ng was saying that many times, and you see this, this software, these AI algorithms are becoming commoditized. A lot of them are open source, so people have more access to it. So again, having this data oftentimes is more paramount to actually having the software. So how you collect data, do you have the data, will be critical. So here are my recommendations. Um, and it plays in many ways you've, what you've already heard today um, at the keynotes, but I really wanted to aggregate and kind of give you this, this really nice um, and, and, and more efficient way of like, you know, here are the things that I really should focus on. Not just the three top things, but let's put more things together. So really think big, but start small, right? So you have this idea, you have your vision where you want to get, but you want to start small. You want to choose the easy problems with high ROI. Start with simple algorithms, simple machine learning. So you can start with you know, linear regression, basic clustering to focus and find what your data sets represent. But you also want to be realistic. And you want to make sure that your team understands that your VPs and C-level execs under understand that most machine learning projects will not be this huge step, but rather they'll be small and incremental gains as you progress. You want to hire expert. You want to ex hire senior data practitioners before um, you know, hiring junior ones. Sometimes one or two super powerful rock star data scientists will be far more valuable than junior data scientists and will be able to deliver and bring the products online. If you're looking for who to hire, if you don't have data scientists specifically, but generally what's, what we've seen is, you know, uh, individuals with engineering and physics degrees are great for data science. They already have the training, um, they know how to use statistical models, and on top of that, they can actually program and build something. Um, if you're looking for specific languages or, or tools, Python and Spark are definitely uh, great to start with. Python is on top of the languages right now uh, when it comes to data science and data engineering and the support on Spark. So now we have these two great tools that are very good to start with. Uh, you want to understand the basics very well, so you know where you're starting from. You want to have also a data infrastructure in place. So having the right tools is important. And the reason why it's important is because uh, you want to make sure that your data scientists are not frustrated and they don't leave the company. There's a lot of stories where they come in, they don't have proper access to the data, they can't figure out where the data is, um, and that's something that you uh, will definitely need to help them with. Again, if you don't have good data, make sure you acquire the data. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, if you put junk in, you're going to get junk out, right? So that data, again, it's got to be high quality, it's got to be clean, it's got to be well labeled uh, for you to have good results. Generally, a mix of algorithms better than a single algorithm. And of course, what's very important, you want to make sure that you can package the results, package the machine learning algorithms quickly, have that platform that can do it uh, for the deployment, so now you actually have real results. And of course, just do it. Just start doing it. Just start on the process is yet another one. Long term, you want to complement your data science teams with, with other individuals. Uh, for example, you know, citizen data scientists, additional individuals that can help them 
push things into the pipeline so they can focus on, uh, on the higher level things of actually doing the machine learning rather than just spending 80 to 90% of their time, or in case of deep learning, 98% of their time on just dealing with data, labeling, and so forth. Um, you want to choose a data science platform. At some point, there's still a lot of battles of who's on top, and still, you know, the, the platforms for data science are maturing and uh, maturing very fast at that. Um, so you might want to choose one today, but two, three years down the road, there might be even better one. So take that into consideration. Um, of course, like you heard, determine what's good for on-prem versus the cloud, right? What will be long running, what will require lots of GPUs uh, and might run for days or, or sometimes weeks if you have these very large projects, so that is important. And you want to do and still at all levels of your company in this data analytics culture. And I think that's very important, making sure that everybody understands what this, um, what this culture is all about. If you're looking at data science platforms, you know, you can quickly look at Gartner and see where everybody is. There's been a lot of movement. Probably this report will be even better uh, for next year. So I'm not going to go over these, but if you want to take a picture of this one, I've just come up like, you know, what are some of the questions? So you've heard a lot of the questions today. What is it that you should consider? You know, things that you should always pay, uh, pay attention to, things that you might want to talk to with your team, with whoever you bring on board. You know, where is my data? What type of dev environment, infrastructure we're going to use? Uh, where are we going to use it? Uh, you know, is, is it GDPR compliant, right? If it's services, what's the true cost of ownership? What's the ROI? And are we going to develop in-house or are we going to bring consultants? Things like that that will happen. And of course, most importantly is, you know, how will we test, deploy it, and manage these machine learning models as you deploy? And, and how we would package and commercialize if this is something that's external versus internal. So, final final quote is you know that the gap for most companies uh, isn't that the machine learning doesn't work, but that they struggle to actually use it. So you know again going to the basics, make sure you know the space you're in and how you're going to apply it. So with that, you know. Just go and apply um, all the different verticals. You can definitely use the tools. The tools are there. Um, uh, the experts are there. Uh, lots of examples on YouTube and all kinds of resources. So really, it's just about spending time learning the technology uh, and, and be able to push through and figure out you know, what would be your, your infrastructure. With that, we got a few minutes for questions. Uh, and I'll open uh, to that. There's a microphone, or, or you can speak out loudly. Um, at this point. Yes? Why do I think that there's not that much conversation about talking about you know, big deep learning for CPUs versus? So I think right now, for example, what we provide, and you heard the keynotes, you know, if, 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 if the specific algorithms or specific tools um, that you're using are optimized for GPUs, go ahead and pull all the GPUs that you have in your cluster run GPUs. If it's you know, CPU intensive and it will be performance CPUs, for example, a lot of the algorithms that, you know, when you start with Spark, they will perform very well with just the CPUs, right? But if you go deep learning route, you know, you might want to go with the latest CUDA drivers running on your, um, you know, latest uh, Titan GPU graphics card, and that's the space you want to go. Or perhaps, you know, you're in the Google Cloud, and now you're using TensorFlow, so you want to use tensor processing units, which are optimized just for use um, uh, for that specific ones. Or perhaps Microsoft's got, you know, FPGAs in the clusters and some other specific specific hardware that's just good for either that specific framework or, or tool that you're going to use for, for, for whatever the use case. So that's something you have to evaluate. And of course, one thing to always keep in mind is, you know, what is, what is the cost? So you might want to test things initially with small data sets on your local machine or your la local laptop, small server in-house. And then, you know, you're like, okay, now we have lots of data. Let's expand it. So you might want to spin up some ephemeral clusters. And then at one point, it's like, okay, we've got this down and we want to retrain this algorithm on, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. So let's have some stuff on-prem that can run 24 seven, right? So again, there's this kind of hybrid environment and conversation that we're all having. So this is a thing to figure out. Any other questions? All right. With that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. If you want to just chat out here, I'll be here for a few more minutes. Thank you very much.